ready for the word. <laughs> man, man. Well, we're going to be kicking off a new series called Weatherproof. Weatherproof, man. And week one, and let me kind of lay this thing out uh, for you guys. How, how many of you know that uh, to be weatherproof means that we, we don't need to let everything that we're experiencing on the outside get on the inside? Amen. That we can go through some things in our life. And if we uh, and if we're not careful, we can let them shape and mold our attitudes and we can let them shape and mold how we view life and how we view people. So in this journey and in this series, as we take this journey, my goal and my plan is to show you how you weatherproof your life. Amen. How, how do we do that? How do we go through storms and how do we go through seasons and how do we deal with challenges and how do we deal with issues and how do we deal with some people? Come on, somebody. And how do we not let that uh, reflect in how we view life and how we view our own life and other people? How do we do that? How do we weatherproof our life? Amen. So let me give you a real quick definition of, of weatherproof. And I just love it. It's not not able to be changed or damaged by the effects of. Here's a second definition. Able to protect someone or something from the effects of. I mean, here, here's the thing. That this has a twofold application that in Ephesians chapter one, that you've been sealed with the Holy uh, Spirit of promise. In other words, there's a, a seal on the inside of you. And as long as you're carrying God around with you, the power of God, the resurrected power of Jesus on you. How many of you know you can go through some storms? Last time I checked that Jesus said, hey, I'm not sending you around them. I'm going to send you right straight through them as the disciples went through the storm. Why? Because they were weatherproof. Because you're going to go through some things in this life and you need to understand how we deal with them. How do we maneuver? How do we navigate the storms and the challenges and the issues in our life? And we've been sealed. We bring God with us everywhere. So whether I'm experiencing the, the Ephesians 3.20, the exceedingly or the abundantly, as long as I, if, if I'm on the mountain or if I'm in the valley, whether, whether I'm going through good times or whether I'm going through bad times, my life is going to be proof that God is active and alive. That deserves a better amen than that. Because there's a lost and dying world that's watching you. And whether it's good or whether it's bad, our lives should be proof that God is real, that he's good, that in the good times, God's goodness is shown through our lives. But in the bad times and through when I'm weak, how many of you know that he's strong? And that so in my weakness, God's strength is on display. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley, my life is going to be proof that there's a God. Come on, somebody. Y'all wake up with me. You with me? That deserves a better amen than that. Well, Acts chapter 27, if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. I love the Apostle Paul. I love talking about him. And if, if you're here today and, you'll, and, and you're not a Christian, you got a lot in common with Paul because he wasn't always a Christian. He, he murdered people. He was a bad dude. But how many of you know that he had an encounter with Jesus and it's a spiritual impossibility to encounter the spirit and the person of Jesus and not be changed? If you've been here for any amount of time, you've heard me say that before and I'll say it again. Because we need to have our lives reflect in the fact that we've encountered Jesus. And it's a spiritual impossibility to encounter God and not be changed. So in Acts chapter 27, let me set up the content uh, for, for this sermon. Um, Paul has gone through some stuff. Paul has been arrested. He went to Jerusalem to declare the word of God, to preach the gospel. And how many of you know they came against Paul? To the degree that the Romans had to put him in prison just to protect him. And there was a governor there by the name of Felix that questioned Paul uh, about what he was doing and what he was saying. And Felix said, I find no fault in Paul. But in order to keep the religious people happy, he kept him locked up in prison. He kept him locked up. And so not knowing what to do with him, uh, because the Jews had plotted to kill Paul, they plotted to kill him. So King or so Governor Felix said, let's take him to Caesarea Maritime and we'll just keep him locked up in prison and just get him out of Jerusalem. So Paul sat in prison for two years until until the governorship, the governor changed. And finally, they brought him in front of King Agrippa and they questioned him and they still found no fault in him. But Paul appealed to Caesar. 
He said, I want to go to Rome. I appeal to Caesar. And if it wasn't for that, they probably would have let him go. So they said, you appeal to Caesar. Caesar you want. Caesar you get. So in this point, in this juncture, Acts chapter 27, they're putting him on a ship to send him to, send him to Rome to stand before, before Caesar. And we'll start out in verse 4. And putting out to sea, from there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. If you like underlining stuff, that's a good spot right there in your Bible. The winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Sicilia and Papavila, don't be laughing at me because I can't pronounce all these. When we came to Myra in Lycia, the centurion found a ship of Alexander sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off of Snidus. And as soon as the winds did not allow us to go any further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off of Salome, coast along, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Haven, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sir, men, I perceive that this voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than what Paul said. Of course, I mean, when you're talking about sailing, I mean, you're going to you're going to get advice from the from the pilot of the ship than the preacher. I mean, we know a lot, but I don't know sailing. So at the end of the day, they took the advice of the pilot. And how many of you know? How many of you know that we're led by the Spirit of God? That we're not just driven by our carnal senses. And sometimes when we recognize in the storms in our life, we got to understand that there's some winds and there's some things that are blowing contrary to what, to what we need to do. And do we recognize that? Do we discern that? Do we walk by uh, and led by the Spirit or do we just let our carnal uh, mind drive us? Because at the end of the day, I mean, the pilot had the nautical maps and he, he knew the route and he could probably look at the stars and he could navigate uh, by the stars. But how many of you know, um, if, if you're recognizing the storm and you're understanding that the Spirit, that the wind, and that word wind in Hebrew is ruach. Come on, say it with me. Ruach. Don't spit on the back of your neighbor's head <sighs> like you got some phlegm. But it says that word ruach is spirit, breath, or wind. So sometimes the, the, the spirit is blowing contrary uh, to, 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 to what's going on in our life. And I just believe that when we start listening to the, the spirit of God and when we begin to be led by the spirit of God and we start recognizing and discerning what the spirit is doing and what the spirit is leading us to do, that we'll start seeing something doing contrary to what God is wanting us to do. So we can we discern. And notice the progression. In verse 4 it says, the winds were against us. Verse 7 it says, the winds did not allow us to go any further. And in verse 9 it says, the voyage was now dangerous. Didn't take the advice of Paul. Listen to the pilot. Driven by their carnal senses. Hey, I get it. It's easy to walk by what we see and what we touch and what we feel and, and, and what we what we smell and what we experience. But if you're you're going to recognize storms in your life, if you're going to understand that there's going to be some opposition against you. How many of you know you need to walk by faith and not just by sight? Now, I believe sight's good, but if you can discern some things coming against you. There was a progression that the wind was blowing contrary, that it was difficult and then it become dangerous. Some of us don't recognize a storm and we've not weatherproofed ourselves to where we're walking by faith. We're walking and being led by the spirit and things are blowing against us. And the spirit of God is trying to reveal truth to us. But we're so carnally minded that we don't recognize it. We look at our nautical maps. We look at the stars. We look at the boat and we say, I can do it. Paul says, sir, yo, man, this isn't good. Why? Because Paul was in tune with the spirit of God. And maybe you're here today. You're like, man, I can't recognize when God warns me. What does that look like? Well, can I tell you that God's warning will never create worry in you? That's a better place for an amen than that. 
that God's warning will not create worry in you. What it'll do is it'll feed your faith. It'll give you specific instruction and it will mobilize you and move you and it'll build your faith. In other words, the enemy comes in and he sows seeds of lies and he sows this doubt. And so you're not recognizing the voice of God. But can I tell you, when you start feeding off the enemy's lies, it starts increasing your fear. I said it starts increasing your fear. So if you're laying in bed at night and you're, and you're in the storm and you don't know what to do and there's fear that's being built on the inside of you and there's anxiety and there's depression and you've got all these things and you're tossing and you're turning. Can I tell you, you're not feeding off faith. You're feeding off fear. God will never leave you worried. He'll never, when he gives you a word and you're mobilized by it, he never leaves that anxiety he never leaves that depression he never creates worry and the feeling of fear i mean how often do we learn to live with dread how, how often do we just conduct our lives as that's normal i mean think about it church you know we walk around with fear doubt unbelief anxiety and we drag that thing around like it's a normal thing and I'm here to tell you that when God gives you a word, when he gives you a warning, when you're in tune with the spirit of God and God is showing you some things, he's showing you some spirits that are coming against you that are contrary to you. It doesn't create fear. It doesn't create doubt. It doesn't create anxiety. It doesn't create these things that keep you up at night. It doesn't create worry. It gives you a word and it mobilizes you and it moves you and it builds your faith. Some of us need to feed our faith this morning. Some of us need to tune out all these other things. We need to stop looking at our nautical maps and stop looking at the carnal things in life and try to navigate by the Spirit of God. It could avoid a lot of things. It could have avoided this, this storm. Can I tell you that feelings can't forecast the future, only God's Spirit? I'll say it again. Your feelings cannot forecast the future. It can't. But God's spirit can lead you. One of the perform one of the things that the Holy Ghost does for you is he shows you things to come. Not only is he a comforter, not only does he give you power to witness, he shows you things to come. And so often when we're looking at just the carnal reality of our lives, we'll walk right into a storm. And guess what? Sometimes we can't go around it. Sometimes we have to go through it. But you know what? We can be prepared. We can be a prepared people. We can get a word from God that can mobilize us, that can equip us. They can discern something. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Help me preach this thing this morning, man. Some of us have been going through some storms. But we've been weatherproofed. That we've been equipped. That only God's spirit forecasts the future. I mean, do we hear God's voice? Do we hear God's voice above all others? Or do we hear all others' voices above God? Because when you're looking at your nautical map and when you're looking at your... The, the carnal things in life. Can I tell you, you'll hear all other voices above God's when God's saying, hey, let me lead you by my spirit. Let me show you some things. I need you feeding your faith and not feeding your fear. I need you to start hearing the voice that I'm speaking to you. I need you to identify what I'm trying to tell you in this season and knowing what you're listening to. If it's creating this anxiety, if it's creating depression, then can I tell you, you're not listening to the voice of God because God's voice will always feed your faith. He'll always feed your faith. So some of us are we're navigating life just by what we see, what we hear, what we smell. Just this carnal life. And how many of you know you just don't find yourself in the middle of a storm? Some of you woke up and it's like, oh, all hell is breaking loose around you. But can I tell you, it didn't just start then. You may have identified it then. But it, like in the natural with any storm, listen to me. You can see the atmosphere changing. See the wind shifting. You can sense some things. The barometric pressure drops. Some old timers say, oh, my bones are aching. There's a front coming. I think as the church, we should be discerning some things. We need to be discerning something. Hey, I got a word for you about a season that you, because guess what? God does that. 
got to send people in your life. And I'm talking about a word, not a whole paragraph. Because how many of you know we can get in there and mess, mess that up with trying to tell a whole story? Well, God said da 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 and da 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 and you need to move to Idaho. What? And let me tell you, if you get a word from, from somebody in this church, it better line up with the word of God. Because if it doesn't, it's not from God. In other words, you need to have caller ID. No, that don't belong to me. Any word given in this church is subject to be examined to the word of God. Period. But God does send people in our lives. He sends people to strengthen us, to declare a word over us, to build our faith. That even when we're going through the storm, that we can we can call and we can cling to those people of like precious faith. Those people that we've knitted our hearts together with that have one common goal and to edify and encourage you and build you up that say, hey, no matter what you're going through, whether you're on the mountain or in the valley, hey, your life is going to be proof that God loves you. And he's for matter of fact, him sending me into your life as a friend is proof that he's mindful of what you're going through. It's proof that he still loves you. It's proof that he's still for you, because guess what? He sent me into your life and I'm building you up and I'm encouraging you and I'm helping you get through this season. Amen. So God, God wants us to be led by our spirit. He don't want us just to be this carnal minded person that goes blindsided in to these storms that we can recognize. Do we hear his voice, church? Do we hear his voice above all others or or do all others voices? uh, Do we hear over his? It's sad. Because we live in a culture and we live in a day and we live in an age where our attention is distracted from the things of God. And God's speaking going, man, it's not going to end good. It's not going to fare well with you. We're going to lose cargo. We're going to lose ship. How many of you have been here today and I'm raising my hand that I've ignored the voice of God. I've ignored the warning of God and it's cost me something. Because anytime you ignore the voice of God and you don't listen to the instructions of God, it's going to cost you something. I said it's going to cost you something. I've ignored it. And it's cost me something. Always. See, Paul represented the the mouthpiece of God. He was an ambassador. He spoke for God. So when he said, man, it's not going to be well. (laughs) It's God saying, hey, man, it's not going to be well. And any time you ignore the advice of God, any time you choose to neglect and choose not to apply the word, the warning that God has given you, it always, listen to me, church, it always ends up in loss. I'm not the only one. I've ignored it and it's cost me some. God has tried to show me some things and I didn't discern them. And I walked right into the middle of a storm and it cost me something. But how many of you know we don't have to go through every storm? We don't have to. Some of it's our own doing. I create storms all the time in my relationship, but I'm an expert at, at patching them up. Men, we're going to have a, a men's uh, marriage conference. You ready? Here it goes. It's a marriage conference. All the men pay attention in your relationship. You, you need to know this. This right here, this statement right here, save your marriage. I'm sorry. and I'm stupid. Perfect marriage. So my grandpa told me, I said, yeah, me and my wife are going to a marriage conference over in Jacksonville. I guess you don't need to do that here. I'll give you some advice. I've been married for over 50 years. He said, this right here, right here, a producer helped me. I thought he was going to give me some profound insight. He looked at me and he said, I'm, I'm sorry and I'm stupid. Marriage is great. It's awesome. It's perfect. She gets it. Amen. Amen. Verse 14 through 15. But soon a tempest wind called a nor'easter struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. How many of us live a life that is just driven along by the conditions, driven along by the storm, driven along by 
doubt, driven along by fear, driven along by anxiety, just driven along wherever it wants to go, wherever it wants to do with me, anywhere it wants to take me. I'm just driven along. I mean, uh, whatever comes my way, I'm just driven along. I guess it's from God. It's bad. I know I've got sickness and I've got to I'm just driven along. I'm driven along by can- I'm driven along by sickness. I'm driven along by depression. Isn't that just the kid? Isn't that so indicative of how we live our life? Just driven along, just driven along. But can I tell you that you've got an enemy out there who seeks whom he may devour? He's like a roaring lion that you have an enemy that's actively coming against you. And if you don't ad- identify what's from God and what's from the devil, you'll just be driven along. You'll just be, you know, just receiving everything that comes your way. Can I tell you that that and I'm just going to throw this out here, that the sovereignty of God has been misrepresented in the body of Christ, that I do believe in the sovereignty of God as supreme being, as high ruler, as as the alpha But I don't believe that he controls everything in your life, that there's a devil. And James 4, 7 says you need to resist the devil. And that word means actively fight against. And if you think it's from God, you're not going to actively fight against it. You're going to submit to the sickness. You're going to submit to the depression. You're just going to be driven along, driven along, driven along. That if you can show me where sovereignty means controlling Show me because it ain't in the dictionary. Religion has taken that and jacked it all up and has fed it to the body of Christ. And they're just driven along, driven along, driven along, driven along. Sick of it. Somebody needs to operate in the authority and the dominion. They need to they they need to take the word of God and say, you know what? This don't line up with God's word. This is of the enemy. I'm going to actively fight against it because the word says so. I'm not being driven along, driven along, driven along. I'm not. I'm taking a stand. Because last time I checked, Jesus didn't put cancer and sickness on anybody. That he healed all. And he was the perfect representation of the Father to the degree that he told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You show me where Jesus was rejecting people and putting sickness on them. He wasn't. He was healing all that was depressed. He was setting the the captives at liberty. He was doing good everywhere that he went. So you show me in the word of God where Jesus put sickness on people to show them something. You show me where he was just driving people along. No, he was setting people free along the way. I said he was setting people free along the way. And so we need to resist the devil, actively fight against him. Man, driven along by fear. We just go with whatever. Having no clear anchor in anything. No clear anchor in anything. No anchor in Him. And we're, we, we attach ourselves to whatever is coming at us in our life. And that's how we're driven along. When we need to have our hope and anchor it in Jesus. And so when we look into the Word and we see what Jesus did in the life of people, we need to realize that belongs to me. That's mine. I'm not just driven along like these sailors were, like these men, like these prisoners. And in verse 16, it says, as we pass to the lee of a small island called Cadia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. trying to hold the ship together. Can I tell you this? Some of the storms that we experience, we try so hard to hold certain ships together when at the end of the day, maybe it's the ship that you're aboard that has caused you to be in the storm that you're in. That maybe some of them relationships that has taken you further, maybe some of them friendships and you trying so hard to tie it all together and hold it together in the storm. And can I tell you, it just might be the boat, the vessel that has put you where you're at, right in the middle of your storm, that you're not able to identify. You're not able to discern because all you're doing is looking at, at the crew and at the cargo and at the nautical maps. And you're trying to look at the stars and figuring out how you navigate, how you're going to navigate this storm, holding the ship together. Can I tell you that when God gives you a word, you need to be obedient. And sometimes it's let the ship go, men. Let it go. The very thing that you're holding on to is trying 
It's taken you through that storm. And although you've been weatherproofed, you don't have to go through every storm. Sometimes you can use some wisdom that God had given us. How many of you know Jesus is wisdom unto us? And so sometimes we can go around them. Sometimes it's the very relationships that we're trying to hold together has put us where we're at. So, I mean, the wind, the spirit is blowing contrary. I mean, it's difficulty. It's hard to pass, the text says. In other words, there was a progression in this storm that, that the spirit of God, there's a progression as you start getting closer to the eye of the storm, to the middle of the storm. You need to look and understand that the horizon is dark, that the pressure is falling, that the wind is picking up, and you don't need to ignore it. That very ship that you're getting on might be the very ship you need to set, then you need to send down the road. Hallelujah, that deserves a better amen than that. I've been preaching myself happy all week with this. I've been feeding on this message myself. How many of you know the chef needs to eat what he's cooking every now and then? So I've been preaching myself happy. You know, some of them ships, man. Uh, trying to hold it together. Here, here it is, it says, because they were afraid. How many of you are holding on to relationships because you're afraid? You're afraid. You're afraid of what a changed life might look like. You're afraid of what freedom might look like in Christ Jesus. You're, you're afraid of what uh, not being dependent on, 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 on drugs, not being dependent on. You're afraid of what that looks like. So you hold on to this thing and you try to hold it together through, through the storm. It says they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbar of, of citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and they let the ship be driven along, driven along, driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm. Some of you are holding on. I could preach. I could preach a whole afternoon on this passage. Some of you are holding on to relationships that are battering you along, battering you along, driving you along. I don't know what it is. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. But some of you are trying to hold something together that God is, is saying, just let it go. That it's battering you and it's beating you up. And can I tell you that that he doesn't cause worry in your life. He'll he'll feed your faith and not your fear. And so you're you're afraid of, of losing this this ship, this relationship. And God's saying, let it go. You don't need to be battered you don't need to look to the pounding you need to look to the promises Is anybody hear me this morning and so you're just driven along driven along driven along man getting beat up pounded battered because you're afraid Woo, i'm preaching better than you're responding hallelujah hallelujah they took such a violent battering from the storm and that the next day they begin to throw the cargo overboard. There's a word for somebody. You need to throw something overboard in your life. I don't know what it's looking like. You need to throw something overboard. Is anybody hearing me? That you need to let something go. That you need to lighten the load. Sometimes when we're going through some storms and we're encountering some storms, we need to throw some things overboard. We need to lighten the load because we're holding on to it and it's getting so heavy. It's heavy. We need to lighten the load. Those things are holding us back, getting battered and beaten and pounded. And we're so focused on the pounding that we forgot about the promise. Man, we forgot about the promise because we're so focused on the pounding. Oh, because we're afraid to let some things go. It says on the third day. How many of you know some good things happen on the third day? Some real good things happen on the third day. Woo, I love the third day. I love third day. I love third day. They threw the ship's tackle overboard with their hand. And when neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days and the storm continued to rage, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. See, it went from, it went from, in the beginning, they were anxious. They were still active. It got so, so bad that they couldn't see the stars. That they were, they were so consumed with the pounding and they were so consumed with the ship and they were so consumed with the cargo and, and, and uh, they couldn't see the light because it was dark. How many of you have been in a storm that you've gotten so deep in it that it's gotten so bad that you can't see any light? That, that when you look, you don't see no visible sign. It don't look like God is there. How many of you have been through a storm like that? A storm that has just been so violent that the battering and the beating, maybe it's from abuse, maybe it's from a substance, maybe it's from a relationship. 
Oh, they lost all hope. That's so bad. When you get to that point where when we lose all hope, see, it went from anxious, but still active. It went from anxious, but yet still active, to despair and then depression. How many of you going through a storm and you're just depressed? I mean, it didn't just start out that way. You may have been anxious, but you were still maneuvering through this. You were still maybe bailing water. You were still doing some things. But see, when you lose all hope and, and, and you look and it doesn't seem like God is in this with you, that maybe you've gotten yourself in it and you don't think that God is going to get you out. In other words, maybe you lost your job because of something that you did and you feel like I got myself into this mess. So I'm going to have to get myself out. How many of you know we don't serve a God that operates like that? That when we repent, when we change our thought process, when we come to him boldly to the throne of grace and we petition him. How many of you know we can have confidence that he'll be our help, that my help comes from the Lord. I fix my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. That in my faults and in my failures, yeah, I might got myself in it, but my God is so good. It's not dependent on what I did or what I didn't do. I'm looking to Jesus. I've got my anchor in Jesus and Jesus is going to get us through the storm he can't deny himself yeah we might put ourselves in it how many of you been in some stuff that you put yourself in how many of you how many of you out of that stuff Jesus did that for you I'll say it again Jesus did that for you but they went from despair to depression listen to what depression is giving up any hope that you'll feel any different than the way you feel right now Hope, we can't live without it. Hmm. Acts 20, 21 and 25 reads. And after he had gone a long time without food, say poor Paul. Poor Paul. That's what I thought. I was like a long time without food. Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice. How about we preach a Mother's Day sermon that's called, Men, you should have taken my advice. How many of you, how many of you women would like that for Mother's Day? Men, I didn't know Paul was a woman. Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself in this damage of loss. Men, you should have taken my advice. I'm giving you women permission. That's your life verse. Put it on your mirrors, on your refrigerators. Men. Should have taken my advice. But now, aren't you so glad for but nows when it comes to God? I urge you to keep up your courage because not a one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be, be destroyed. Now, but now. But now, how many times have God intervened in our life? And it was like, but God, but now that we need to live in the now that now faith is now it is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. But now everything changed with but now everything changes in your life when God shows up. But God, I don't know if I'm the only one, but there was a lot of storms that I've went through and I put myself there. But thank God. But now. Now God showed up, but now God gave a word, but now everything's going to change. But now listen to what he says. I urge you to keep up your courage because not a one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Only the ship. I got some good news and I got some bad news, boys. The ship's going to be destroyed. How many of you know that's bad news? How many of you know one word can make a difference in your storm? Their word was only. How many of you know that one word in your storm with what you're going through can be the difference between the ship being destroyed or only the ship being destroyed? And you need to recognize what word it is God speaking to you in the middle of your storm. I'm preaching to somebody. You need to understand what the spirit of God is trying to communicate because it's not building fear. It's not creating anxiety. It's not creating uh, depression. But what it's doing is it's feeding your faith. 
God's speaking a word that you need to cling to in the middle of your storm. You need to cling to that thing. And listen to what it says. Last night, last night, an angel of, of the God in whom I belong and to whom I serve, who I am and whose I am is so vital in your storm. Who I am and whose I am is so vital in the middle of the storm. Whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid. In other words, this angel came and he spoke to, to Paul and he stood right beside him. Aren't you so glad we got a God that will stand right beside us through the middle of the storms? Hey, he'll not just stand beside us. He'll go in front of us. He'll stand beside us. We serve a multi-directional God, an omnipresent God, that if he needs that 360 God, is anybody hearing me? I told you I've been preaching this thing all day long, all week long, nailing up siding. Yes, Lord, we, we serve a 360 God, but do we serve a God that can nail up siding for me, Lord? Yes, I'm so glad that we serve a God that goes in front of, stands behind or beside, to the left, to the right. Wherever we need, we serve a 360 God. Wherever we're at in the storm, He serves us where we're at. He loves us where we at. 360 God, I love it. Omnipresent, all directions. There's no place that we can go, no place that we can hide. David said, if I go to the depths, if I go to Sheol, that you're there. I can't hide from your presence because you're a 360 God. God, aren't you so grateful for a 360 God that he ain't just limited to this space and he's just not limited to this space, but he can be wherever you want at any time you need. If he needs to stand in front of you, he can. If he needs to stand beside you, he can. If he needs to encompass you and, and hold you and be the spirit that is around you, he can. He's that 360 God. Wherever, whenever, what you need, when you need it, always on time, aren't you so thankful for the cross? Come on, give it up for Jesus. I told Paul, don't be afraid that you must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as you told me. Mm. Point number two. We need to change our perspective. And hold on to faith. See only the ship will be destroyed. Only the ship. So how do we keep up our courage. When the boat is going down. How do we. How do we. Praise God we're going to make it. The boat's going down. How do we how do we keep up our courage when when the conditions, when the when the boat, when when it's going down? Isn't that the essence of faith? Isn't that the heart? Isn't that the substance of what faith is? How do we do that? How do we keep up our how do we do that? How do we hold faith into to what God is doing, even when our ship is going down? Can I tell you the how we do it, church? That our courage and our faith is not connected. To our conditions. See, some of you, your faith is connected to your conditions. So when when your bank account starts dwindling, so does your courage. See, as long as the account's up here, my courage is up here. But as soon as that thing starts dropping, so how how do you how do you keep up your, your faith and how do you have courage even when the ship's going down? You can't connect your courage. You can't listen to me, church. Your courage can't be connected to your conditions. It can't be connected to your conditions because if it's connected to that relationship, when that relationship starts going down, then your faith is tied up in it. How do you get through the storm even though your boat's going down? How do you keep up your courage? How do you keep up your faith? How do you keep walking? How do you keep moving through this storm? It's because your faith is not connected to your condition. It's not. Your anchor, your anchor is not attached to the conditions. See, I love this. The conditions were outside of Paul's control. Would you agree with me, church? How many of you know that the conditions were outside of, but what was in Paul's control? His courage. Can I tell you, church, 
that your condition might be outside of your control, but, but your courage is up to you. Your faith is attached to you and not what you're going through and not what you're experiencing and not in your relationship and not in your job and not in your finance. Anybody hear me? That your faith is connected and anchored to Jesus. And so when, when the pounding starts and we don't look to the promises, you know why? Because our courage is connected to the conditions. So when it starts beating the boat and starts breaking up some things in our life, our faith is connected. See, I'm telling you, you've got to sever your faith. You've got to sever your courage from the conditions because the conditions are subject to change. They're up, they're down. They're up, they're down. But one of the realities and one of the facts about weatherproofing is that we don't let what's going on on the outside affect us on the inside. That our faith is not connected to what we're going through, but it's connected to who we belong to. Come on, somebody. That our faith is connected to to the one that walks on the wind and the water and the waves. He's the one that we connect our faith to, not the condition. Man, I pray that you guys get a revelation of that. We need to feed our faith and not our fear. We need. Hey, and we want the storm to stop. We want it to stop. But God is weatherproof stuff to go through anything. Can I tell you that greater is he that is in me than anything that you'll ever go through? That you've been sealed with it. That you take Jesus with you everywhere. That you've got the resurrection power of God on the inside of you. And you need to recognize that. And you need to understand that you can, you're can. you equipped to walk through anything. Why? Because my faith isn't in my condition. My faith is in the, the God that walks on the, the, the water and the, and the waves. Amen? Man, he's, he's weatherproofed us. It's not about the condition. It's not about the condition. It's not. It's not about it. It's about your courage. It's about your faith. We don't need God to fix the ship. We don't need God to fix the boat. See, when God stopped the storm and this boat is falling apart, please fix the boat and stop the storm. How many of you would just say, hey, that's what I'm looking for? That's what I'd be praying if I was on that boat. God, stop the storm. At least put the boat together. Do you not see where we're at and what we're going through? But can I tell you that our hope is not in the boat? I'll say it again. The hope's not in the boat. How many of us put our hope in temporary things? Things that fade away. We put our hope in, in finances and hope in, in, in relationships. And we put our hope in everything else besides Jesus. We put our hope in the boat. And so when the boat begins to break apart, then our hope goes. It goes. And so you've got all these men, these carnal men. You've got them. And their hope is in the boat. See, the boat's going to be destroyed, but we're going to need to let go of some things. It's okay. It's okay. Hey, listen, God didn't promise to save the boat. He didn't promise that I wouldn't cry. He didn't promise that I wouldn't go through trials. But what he did promise is that when I do, he'll dry every tear. That he'll be there. He'll never leave us or forsake us. That God, he will walk through the middle of the storm with us. That you don't need to put your hope in the boat. Too many people put their hope in the boat. And when the boat perishes, so does your hope. And you're in a condition of depression that you'll never think that you can be any different than you are in that moment as your boat is going down. My hope's not in the boat. My hope is in the God that holds my life in his hands. Come on, somebody. My hope is in the one who created the wind and the waves. My hope is in the one that made the wood for the boat. That's going to make the difference. Because that ain't fickled. It ain't going away. It ain't changing. It's everlasting. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. My hope's into something that is everlasting. And I'm confident that I'll see the goodness of the Lord. That was Paul's cry. He knew it. He knew that he wasn't going down with the boat because his hope wasn't in the boat. Listen to verse 41. It happened just like, like Paul said. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and it would not move. And the stern was broken into pieces by by the pounding of the surf. Not looking at the pounding, but looking at the promises. 
I'm focused on the pounding, but looking to the promises. And the soldiers plan to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plans. See, when the enemy has a plan to take you out, God has a plan to keep you in. When the enemy plans to take you out in the middle of your storm, how many of you know that God's got a plan to keep you in? That he's not forgot about you. That it says the centurion kept them. How many times has God kept us? How many times has God done some things for us that we didn't even realize? How many times has he kept us? How many times were we running late for something all ticked off and all hot? How many, in, how, how many of you know how many things God probably saved us from that we don't even know? How many times have God kept us? How many times I can't find my keys and I'm, and I'm like, God, come on, kids, come on, wife, let's go. How many times has God kept me from avoiding a drunk driver? How many times has God avoided some things in my life that I don't even know about? That God, the 360 God that we serve, the, the, the multi-directional, he keeps his people. How many times? Countless. How many times has he kept us and we don't even know about it? How many times I get a flat tire and I'm like, oh, y'all pray for me. How many times, church? How many times? How many times? Man, he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get the land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. In this way. In this way. In this way. How many of you, if you're like me, um, we put our hope in the way God's going to get us out of the storm. And it's never in our way, but it's in this way. The very thing that that I was, hey, we'll just put it like this. How often do we put our faith in the way that God is going to get us out instead of the God that can get us out? That we're looking at it saying, well, God, if you, I mean, I'm stuck in here and I know I'm here um, probably by my own choice and I didn't listen to you. But how often do we, we put more faith in how God's going to do something instead of in the God that does something? And so we're spending so much time trying to figure out in what way um, God's going to get us out and get us through the storm and, and how God's going to and what way is God going to get us out of this financial mess? And, and what way is God going to get me out of this ab- abusive relationship? In what way? And God's saying, hey, you don't need to put faith in what way you need to put faith in a God that can do it this way or that way or this other way that God has a million ways of doing things. But you need to get your faith out of in the way that God's going to do it and put it in the God that can do it. That deserves a better amen than that. But in this way, everyone reached land safely. In this way, he reached land safely. Listen to what Acts 28.1. I'm not preaching the whole chapter. I'm not preaching the whole chapter. Paul makes it through the storm. They're doggy paddling up on, you know, the ones that can swim. The other ones are clinging to the boat, going, God, help us. And so they climb up on this island called Malta, and they're, they're crawling up there. And it's not like, you know, this isn't a Disney cruise ship, so um, I picture that they were, you know, it's not like the corona moment, find your beach, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, they make it. They make it through the storm. It's just as Paul says, and once safely on the shore, we found out that the island was called Malta and the islanders showed up with unusual kindness. In other words, listen to me, don't miss this. God had already prepared a people that was there waiting, that was going to meet some needs. Some of you are holding on to some ships, worried about how God's going to meet needs. But these people were waiting on Paul and they showed kindness to Paul. In other words, don't hold on to people so tight that, that, that you're afraid and that you're looking at the pound and, and you're trying to hold the ship together because you're scared that God doesn't have someone else. That there were some people that God had placed in the path of these men. And when they got to that beach, God knew it. God had some people there. 
and they show kindness. So don't you ever hold on to somebody so so tight thinking that if God's going to do it, it's going to be through through that person. Because can I tell you that God has a way? Of, we serve a 360 God. God has a way of placing people in your path that's going to build you up, that's going to encourage you, that's going to be there for you, that's going to show kindness to you, that's going to do some things in your life. If you let go of the boat, let go of the boat, your hope is not in the boat. And he had to step out. Think about Peter. Peter had to let go of the boat. Where the condi- If the conditions would have been good, do you think Peter could have walked on water any better than with the wind and the waves and in the storm? In other words, the condi- <laughs> you can't walk on water if it's clear. <laughs> if, it's, if there's sunshine in the air, you can't. You can't walk on water no more than when the waves and the wind are pounding. Can't do it. God always knows. He always knows. And listen to what it says. The islanders showed unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us because it was raining and cold. And Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. And as he put it on the fire, a viper, a snake, driven out by the heat, fastened it itself in Paul's hand. And no, there was no committee or anybody that ran over and said, oh, Paul. Paul, I'm sorry this had happened. Matter of fact, the island said, man, this guy must be a murderer, man. This, this, this might be, you know, this might be God's judgment on him. Nobody ran over to Paul. Nobody ran over and said, hey, let me, let me help you out. And at this moment, as I was preparing for this message, I thought about a song. I thought about a song that maybe Paul would have in his head at this moment as this snake just attached itself to its hand. And so listen to the, the lyrics of the song. And if any of you recognize the song, um, I'm going to just, just raise your hand. Here's the lyrics. It says, I stay up too late. I got nothing in my brain. That's what people say. That's what people say. I go on too many dates, but I can't make them stay. At least that's what people say. That's what people say. But I keep cruising, can't stop, won't stop moving. It's like I got this music in my mind saying, I'm going to be all right. How many of you recognize that song? Few of you. For those of you that don't recognize it, let me help you out. This is what Paul did to the snake. Play, 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 play. How many of you know Paul shook it off? Shake it off! He just shook it off! I don't know what you're going through, but can I tell you, shake it off and feed your faith. Come on, worship team, help me out. I just want to dance. Ah, woo. Man, shake it off. <laughs> Why? Because in storms, players are going to play. You're going to go through some things and haters going to hate. But how many of you know? We're going to shake it all. Shake it all. Shake it all. Listen, the very same fire that brought the snake out. Listen to me. The very same fire that brought it out was the same fire that consumed it. How many of you know that we serve a God that is a consuming fire? That Paul told Timothy, fan the flame, stir up the gift that's inside of you. You're going to make it through. You're going to see the goodness of the Lord. The same fire, the same thing that brought this, the same passion that you get for the things of God. The same things. When you're going through your storm, don't expect or expect some snakes to come out as the fire of God and the passion of God and the heat for God rises in your life. But can I declare the same fire that brought the snake out? It's the same fire that consumed them. Come on, somebody. That's good. That's good. He's an all-consuming God. He's an all-consuming God. 
that I don't know what you're faced with. But when we start walking by faith and not by sight, and we start holding on and feeding our faith, God, and our perspective changes, that we're equipped. We can go through anything that life throws us, and we can be confident because our hope is not in the boat, but it's in the one that made the wind and the waves. Oh, stand to your feet, Gray City. Woo, stand to your feet. Man. Ah, hallelujah. Man. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus. He's so good. Man, he's the one that gets us through the storm. Do we recognize the storm, Gray City? Do we recognize it in our lives? Do we recognize what to do? who we belong to, who we serve, who goes through the storm with us. He is faithful, faithful, faithful. Man, He's so good. 360, God, I love it. Love it. If I go to the left, He's there. If I go to the right, if I go up, if I go down, He's there. Can't outrun God. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here today. You don't know this Jesus. Maybe you're in the middle of a storm. Can I tell you, just call out to Him. Just call out to Him. He is faithful. He is there. He is willing to save. The Bible says when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, He is faithful, faithful to save. If that's you with every head bow, every eye closed this morning, if that's you and you've never made this awesome King your Savior, He loves you, loves you, loves you. On the count of three, just slip your hands up. Nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. One, two, three. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Hallelujah. Come on, great city. Put your hands together for an awesome God. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the hearts that have been changed and transformed. We thank you that you're faithful. We thank you, God, that through our storms and through our seasons, God, that you have weatherproofed us, that those things that we're experiencing on the outside, it don't have to get on the inside, that we've been sealed, that, Lord, we can look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we can have confidence that our hope is in a good God. We can have confidence it's in a God that's going to see us through the storm. Yeah, we made some bad decisions, but how many of you know that God made a good decision? He sent Jesus to the cross for you. And that today, that bloodstained cross is an empty tomb. He come out of that storm victorious. Hallelujah. Worship God this morning. Worship God this morning. 